On the podcast today, we're going to speak about what am I? So we're going to attempt to answer the fundamental question of existence, the audacity, yeah? <laughs> but this is the essential question, right? And, and especially in Eastern spirituality, what am I? And actually, the question has been framed differently, especially since Westerners came in touch with Eastern spirituality. And this also pinpoints a, a difference between Eastern psychology and Western psychology. For example, uh, when people came in contact with Ramana Maharshi in India in the early 1900s, and especially British people, uh, especially came in contact with uh, Ramana because of the British occupation of India, mm. when the texts in that were, well, or when his talks were translated, that question of what am I was translated as who am I, you see? And so this also goes over to other texts, right? Like if we look into Buddhism, if we look into Taoism, there's often a, an English translation of who am I, like the constant inquiry of who we are. And this articulates a, a big difference between Eastern thought and Western thought because when you say who you are or who are we or who am I, you're implying you're a person. You see, who is Guy Young? It's a wrong question. The question has to be, what am I? That's how the question needs to be framed. And then once you frame it that way, it opens up a whole new spectrum of thought. Because what am I? Not who am I, or who am I is Jason. Well, you know, you can, you can explain it, right? Born in Australia, look a certain way, have certain likes and dislikes for, on a personal level. So there is a limitation. There's a limitation, yeah. You put yourself in a certain frame, frame of mind to figure out the answers of that, and that can give you a lot of limitations. Whereas if you were to ask, what am I? It's a very fundamental question. You can go as far, as, as deep as you can go, really. Exactly. That's exactly right. Like, because when we when we say, as you said, who am I? It's so limited. It's so limited. And as we've spoke about many times on the podcast, the individual itself is limited. And so, knowledge of that individual is also limited. Everything within that spectrum of duality is limited. But when you isolate it to the question of what am I, you're talking about what are the the raw mechanics of the whole entire universe here. So a lot of people say that we, we exist so far beneath the source, right? Like so to say if the Tao is up here, we live so far beneath that essence of the universe, but that essence of the universe is within us. But that's kind of an incorrect way to look at it. Not that we're, be not that we're beneath the source. We are one with it. And we have to also, we have to think about it in the sense of like, if you look at a fractal pattern, you know, when you look at uh, fractal designs and on a fractal design, usually there's like a, a point. We are that point. And all of this back here is like, you could say the ultimate reality. And we're like this focal point of the ultimate consciousness. It's, but it's a localized awareness, right? And so what happens then is we identify with this localization of consciousness and forget that we are all the, the pattern of the fractal you know we are the, the 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 we are the an aspect of the irreducible essence we actually are the irreducible essence of the universe you could say microcosm and macrocosm exactly terminology yeah which is again pr prevalent in gnosticism and hermeticism you know one of the one of the seven laws of of toth is you know as below, so above, you know, as, as above, so below. So that microcosm, macrocosm perspective, and also that's within Taoism as well, where you have, well, it's, in, it's within Hinduism and Buddhism, but especially within traditional Chinese medicine where they look at the human instrument as a miniature universe. It's actually a representation of the whole cosmos. Now, you don't want to think new age or ooh about that, like, like we've got planets inside us and this and that. But the actual way it's structured and designed, the, the chi flowing through it and everything, 
and the meridians and everything is all like a, a miniature aspect of the entire cosmos. Yes, yeah, so when they treat the patient, for example, mm. they will um, examine a lot of things and to uh, diagnose the problem, right? Mm -hmm. And they thoroughly uh, study uh, based on that um, universal knowledge. And uh, the even treatment of someone will be to in line with that order of universe, right? Yeah, yeah. Just to... Um, to fix uh, things that's a bit out of order within the, someone's physical body, mm. but to make it align with the source of universe, so that you are in in align with the universe, so that you get healed. Yeah, mm. and you're a healthy, insane individual from yeah. that perspective. So mm. they're trying to align you with, you know, they're trying to realign you with that source you know you kind of never out of you sort of are out of alignment but they're just you're trying to realign right like so for example when you are in a state of sickness your system has fallen out of balance with that alignment of the cosmic forces that are flowing through us for example our body may not be put together properly and that's from you know you're sitting in a certain way all the time and so forth and so on and then you have to open up those meridians and channels and, and everything like that to come back into alignment and to reach sane uh, sanity, basically. Now, there's, we can, that comes down to diff, different interpretations, inter, interpretations of a lot of different meditation practices, which is not the point of this podcast today. But that lends into what we're talking about. When you're out of alignment with that, then you forget what you are or, or you know you don't remember that you're actually identical with brahman as a jiva as an individual person so that's kind of what all of humanity is going through today or, or has always gone through when we identify with this localization of consciousness as guy young or jason and we think that that's that's it that's who we are is what we are and that's the fundamental problem, right? Who we are is what we are. And it's like, no, no, that's not it. Who you are is, is a label you've beginning, have been given, you know, certain beliefs that you're supposed to identify with. And this is all an, an accumulative set of knowledge. It's not who you naturally are. Like if we look at Lao Tzu's wisdom, we're supposed to stick to the unhewn wood, that raw nature of who we are. And the problem problems occur when we start to try and fall well, or when we start to fall for this self-cultivation mentality that was promoted by people such as Confucius, but it's also promoted in many spiritual traditions where this self-cultivation project, as Lao Tzu would say, is actually is what causes a lot of psychological damage and actually disconnects you from the source. And so you forget who you are and you start to identify with this person who is cultivating a certain individual and there's nothing against meditation practices and so forth and so on Lao Tzu's not, not saying that you shouldn't meditate and practice and, and so forth and so on but the problems come when the person is the one who's meditating and not you know what I mean like you, you're taking it on board as again as an as an identity instead of just practicing like. it's almost like self-cultivation in a completely opposite way that than how it's supposed to be. There's self-cultivation based on social dynamics and social in within the social uh, landscape. Yes. To make sure you have um, a certain um, yeah strong identity within the society. Yes. So that I don't know you get recognized as a role that you play, mm. and that you misunderstand that role is you type of thing. Mm. And that's the kind of um, rabbit hole that you can go down into in the Confucian, <laughs> and Confucianism. So, yeah, it's self-cultivation, you know, way that, again, is a very limited sense, mm. I think. Mm. Um, it doesn't give you opportunity to look within. Mm. You will always have to look outwardly to f put yourself 
within the society and to fit it well. Mm. And that fit it well process is self self cultivation, according to Confucius, right? Yeah, it's good what you said because, uh, <clears throat> especially a lot of Westerners think that spirituality, not just Eastern spirituality, but spirituality in general, should be based on morality. Mm -hmm. And their morality is driven by society, you see? And what society should we base our spirituality on then? Like, should we base it on a communist perspective of society, democratic, Marxist? Like, g give me the word. Like, what, what's the... And the, the problem th there is, is that Eastern spirituality is completely amoral. You know, especially especially Taoism, it's, it's an amoral, natural, naturalistic perspective. It doesn't mean that they want you to go out and just kill people and that. Don't be stupid. Like those sorts of um, those sorts of values are across the board the same. Like um, you know, genuinely and in general, no one wants to kill anyone. Like because from a Taoist perspective, especially, and from Vedanta and Buddhism, you're fundamentally good. There's no reason to, uh, you don't have to even impose that sort of mm. rule upon someone, like that sort of moral. So the morality then gets so refined. It goes from simple things like that to then more complex and, and so forth and so on. And then people base their spirituality upon that. And we've had many cases where, where, we've done, where I've, I have done lectures in places and people, especially Westerners, have this temperament of thinking moralistically about spirituality and again that comes back to individualism right it comes back to you know like these individual habits we have that society should be a certain way and so forth and so on and if that's going to be your mentality then maybe eastern spirituality is not for you because it's, it's amoral it's about coming back into the natural sphere of the world how things work naturally as opposed to to how humans think they should work. Yeah, we know this pretty pretty clearly that the morals moral is completely relative. Mm. What's moral to uh, for an Indian-born individual to what's moral to let's yeah let's say American um, yeah American or Australian-born individuals are two completely different things. Yeah. And like what you mentioned with people who identify as spirituality with the morality, its problem with that is that when people start to defend the morality, it's almost like defending the society, mm. value of the society. Mm -hmm. Why the mor morals are come from um, social values and social rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. That's what morality is based on. Mm -hmm. So that to defend the morality is to defend the society. Mm. And if you were to put it that way, then like, oh, no, I, I don't want to defend society. Right, right. People would be like that, right? Mm -hmm. But that's how it is, really. Yeah, yeah, that's how it is, yeah. So that that's something we really need to think about. That To talk about spirit, spirituality is completely independent from morality or society whatsoever that's what we need to remind ourselves all the time well especially the eastern spiritual traditions are diametrically opposed to society too that's something that people need to think about like if, if you look at Taoism, lao tzu and zhuang tzu are, are is a the the philosophy of Taoism is a critique on confucianism so it's a critique on this confucian illusion that you need to be a role. You need to live a certain role, which is not really who you are. So I need to be a mother because mothers are like this and so forth and so on. There's all of this template, and especially with the Confucian culture, like you know the way that men should be and women should be and the way that the older brother should be and so forth and so on, is all built on the identification with a role, which, which lends into what we're talking about, right? Because you're identifying with a certain persona that you're supposed to, that's a social dynamic, you know? And why Taoism is a critique is because they're saying that's all nonsense. You need to go back to the unhewn wood, the natural way. And Zhuang Tzu would say that even if you're caught in the society and you have a role, the difference between a Taoist and a Confucian is that the Taoist understands that all roles are played, you know, mm -hmm. 
And so they play their role, but they know that that's not who they truly are. They know that who they truly are is the zero perspective, the zero perspective. And what they've been assigned is just the role. And Zhuangzi said that's actually how the healthy and sane person operates in the world because you understand that that's just the role and that's what society demands of you, but that's not who you truly are. And see, that's, the, that's where the hypocrisy and the falsity, falsity of all societies can be revealed because you've got people all around the world assuming a role that they think they are and pretending to and, 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 and acting in accordance with that image of that role. And so that leads to all sorts of psychopathy, as Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi would explain. That leads to all sorts of psychopathy because you're pretending to be someone but who you truly are is the zero perspective. And we, we all are that. We're all the Atman. We're all the, we all are the Buddha mind. And that is just an accumulation. That, and that role, that image you have, is just a projection of your mind that is, is looking for some sort of sense of security in the world. If I'm like this, <clears throat> then that will give me value in the world. Mm. People will respect me. But... You'll never be who you truly are, you know. Usually, people who are usually the people who who are comfortable with their nature are usually mavericks. You know, they they're completely comfortable with their nature, and they actually don't even relate or accord with the social mentality. You know, this is why all of the great sages are, are still popular to today because you know Lao Tzu obviously didn't accord. He tried the game, you know what I mean? He's, he's the librarian, he's doing his gig, and he's like, ah, oh, this is just nonsense. Like, this is just a bunch of crap. I'm out of here, you know? Like, and so, and, but there's been people like that forever, you know? And so, if you're completely identified with an image of who you think you are, then you've already fallen for the trap of existence, that illusion, that hypnosis of Maya, because that's not who you truly are. Yeah, um, like with the role-based society which we are in mm. right now, is because it's almost been forced us to think that way and behave that way. And again, that is, for whatever reason, the, a lot, most of the cases out of insecurity. Mm. Right? You'd like to have a certain role in a society and you want to be liked and get respected and whatsoever. But in the, in the process of doing that, there's a lot of uh, the f force is going into, like you need to induce it, right? In that process, that we are slowly destroying our nature, Right, mm. knowingly, unknowingly, most of the time unknowingly, right? Mm, yeah. mm. And you will suffer from anxiety and stress at times, and at times you actually be okay with it. And that's uh, a lot of times that you get respected and get praised by other people around you and whatsoever, then you feel good. But that also, I think, is false sense of security too. Mm, 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 mm. Like you depend on mm. other people's approve yeah. to see the value of yourself. That's real sense of value at all. Mm. And that whole that uh, landscape itself contributing to our um, chronic suffering, really, that uh, which causes our friction between role and nature, mm. Mm. right? Obviously, that's under strong Confucian way of thinking. That's where the Hippocratic people were born. Yeah. And in a sense, we slowly develop our own hypocrisy within our mind mm. while we're not even aware of it. Mm. It's very subtly, psychologically, mm. that happens within us and that... Um, in the end, can cause a lot of a um, mental problem. I think psychological problem. Psychological I should say. Problems, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but what you're talking about is the is the depth of the psychopathy that we're developing. Like you said, we're not even aware that that's happening to us. 
And so from a Taoist perspective, or even from even if you look at it from Buddhism or Hinduism, the, the depth of the psychopathy is that when you're identified with this role as if it is natural to you, that's where all psychopathy, all falsity and hypocrisy comes from. You see? Because you're identified with something that's not natural. You're trying, to, and, that, and that's the heart of Confucianism, right? The heart of Confucianism is to make an artificial system, which is artificial and not natural, but to make it natural somehow. And this is where Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu just got their hands in the air, just going, all right, leave me out of this. This is like some sort of, you know, mind bending puzzle no, nonsense. nonsense that's going on here. Like, and that's actually not just Confucianism, that's society in general and has been society, any society actually, until even now, where people are taking on roles as if that defines who they truly are. But it doesn't. You know, this is why in the Zhuangzi text, Zhuangzi is making fun of all of the people. Everyone, basically, he makes fun of the philosopher, the politician, the musician, the artist, because they all have identified with a role that they think that's them, and they have a lot of prestige about this role that they think they are. And he's just like, what nonsense? Like, this is not who they are. Like, And this is such a fleeting experience that they're going through. And a lot of people will say, you know, he's pretty negative about it, but he's not being negative. He's just being realistic, and it's actually a lot of wisdom that's encased within in, in that sort of thinking. Because it's so sane. It's so sane, yeah. Mm. Hence, he doesn't suffer from anxiety or stress and everything and this and that. And that's why he says that all of that happens, that stress and anxiety, depression, suicide, all of that comes from this idea that you need to be a role. And this is one of the problems with psychology as opposed to Eastern spirituality because psychology will try and make you feel comfortable with the role you have. You know what I mean? Like, so oh, what are you? Well, I'm a mother. Or I, you know, I uh, work at the post office, and and this. Th but these are all things that these are all activities you do. These are roles that you've you've assumed, and we could argue, okay, the mother role is is natural, but the mentality of the role is is what they're talking about. Like, there's a certain mentality that mothers or fathers or sons or daughters should be a certain way. This is big time in East Asia, right? So, and 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 highlights the Confucian uh, indoctrination in those places where you, you have to act a certain way, uh, no matter what the role is. You know, you, if you're a grandfather, you have to act a certain way, or a grandmother, you have to act a certain way. Yeah, you have to dress a certain way, you yeah. have to look a certain way, you need to walk a certain way, and you yeah. need to sit some certain way. Everything. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Because and so then imagine if Zhuangzi or Lao Tzu were a psychologist. You walk into the psych, you walk in, you go to see a psychiatrist, and and it's Lao Tzu or Zhuangzi. Okay, tell me your story. Well, I'm this. Okay, elimination. That's gone. Well, well, I'm this. Now that's gone too. It's it's an act of subtraction, and then they bring you back to the zero perspective. There's nothing left. And then a lot of people get frightened from that perspective because they go, yeah, but that how do I define myself? You don't have to define yourself. See, this is a problem. The, the, the nature of the mind, as we've spoke many times in this podcast, is empty, spontaneous, and free. So the problem with that then, when, you're not, when you have a sense of uncomfortability with that state of mind, the mind has a tendency to try and solidify itself, to give itself form in, in the sense of images and, and not, not form as in the sense of the body, but form in the sense of images and ways of trying to give itself a life because it's not comfortable with being empty, spontaneous and free. Mm -hmm. So Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, or the, if the Buddha was the psychiatrist, he'd say, you know, come down here and then you, you know, I don't feel any stress or anything here, but I don't feel like I need any sort of uh, action or vocation or anything. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> you know, but we're not taught that way. See, we're not taught that non-doing simplicity uh, just being comfortable in, in the emptiness. Yeah, modern days, uh, psychiatrists or psychologists would uh, deal with a lot of um, people who suffer from psychological issues, mm. and the way they deal with it is almost like you mentioned before that solidifying 
their roles, mm. almost in a way. Mm. And also justifying the roles too, yep. in a way. Mm. And they will just get you to manage the pain or suffering that you go through that moment right and that on or that only just goes so far i think mm. and that's just like temporary remedy mm. band-aid and, solutions and the people who go and see those people feel better because they express their feelings right yes. not necessarily that you have to go and see those people do it but because you give a lot of trust and faith on these people they mm. because they're expert mm -hmm. in okay. mind yeah. but that's way people a lot of people think, think yeah, mm. sure. so that they uh, express their feelings so that they feel much better and but in the end it doesn't get you too far and it doesn't attack the fundamental issues but then like you said when you do go deeper and questioning their roles right then it's frightening frightening it's a scary area because you have been father or mother for decades and you have to come in terms with that you are no longer that role anymore. Yeah. It's a pretty scary way to think, really. Exactly. But that's something we, we all need to address. Yeah. In the Far East and Asian countries, like we were laughingly talk about before that um, you need to walk a certain way, you need to look a certain way, you need to uh, even make up a certain way for females mm. or males or mm. whoever. Um, yeah, you need hairstyle has to be a certain mm. way, mm. Yeah, like mm. in Korea, for example. Yeah, and yeah, all these things come to play. So they fully internalize their role inwardly and outwardly. Mm. That's why you can see pretty distinctively in Far Eastern Asian country or the like Southeastern Asian country, Thailand and mm. these kind of places as well. But what I find in the West, in the Western countries, is that they wouldn't like act outwardly. They wouldn't display themselves in a certain role outwardly, mm. but inwardly, they still playing this role. Yes, they still inwardly identify themselves with this role. Like I'm, uh, yeah, like let's say police officer. Mm. Uh, so I ought to act this way, even when I'm not in duty, on mm. duty, I, I am a police officer, so I should, you know, follow the rules, whatever. <laughs> and all this kind of, so it's very conditioned deep down psychologically. Yep. And that's something we need to address in all individuals. It's across the board, it's not just an ease, no. like what we're talking about is, is Western as well. It, like you said, it may not be displayed as much, mm. but it's inwardly it's there and people identify, that's why they you know, defend themselves a lot. What you're, what you're always doing when you're defending yourself is you're defending an image of who you think you are, a role. And that leads to conflict, leads to violence. And this is the essence of spiritual, uh, Eastern spirituality. It all comes, why there's no peace in the world is because you're defending yourself. You're defending this ego, this sense of self you think you are, these roles that you've accumulated, but they don't exist. And then that is extended into a group mentality where it may be a nation or a religion or so forth and so on, which can only come into conflict with other religions and nations and so forth and so on. Other but groups. Other groups because mm -hmm. the I identification itself is limited. You're limiting yourself at that identification. You know, And so even, even to the extent of, uh, like you said, like our family roles even themselves have to, in, in some sense, be dissolved as we grow. So, for example, we're, we're all born daughter or son, right? We're all born daughter or son. And we are supposed to act as a daughter or son for until our, our mother and fathers pass away. But we still are mother, uh, daughter and son even when they do pass away. You still, have, you still have that ingrained psychology. And what's interesting in a lot of... Uh, shamanic cultures like if, if you look at uh, Papua New Guinea right in Papua New Guinea in the traditional tribes there the what they do with the son when he's 13 right is that the the mother and father and the tribe know that if he doesn't become independent he's he's useless to us to, to, to the tribe he's useless if he's always dependent on us he can't go out and do his own things and so forth and so on he still thinks he's a son 
he still thinks he's a son and he's, you know, he's hanging around mummy and daddy and, you know. And so what they do in, in the traditional Papua New Guinean tribes is they have a, a, a ritual where the seniors of the tribe, they dress up as, as the gods in, in, their, in their tradition. And then unknowingly they attack the sun. And they attack the sun not in a, you know, in a very, not in a kind, playful manner. It's like a full attack. But the, but the intention behind this is to let the sun win. You know, you attack the sun, but you let him fight for himself. You let him fight. And then when he overcomes the gods, so to speak, it, that, that's his initiation into independence, into adulthood, and, and a shedding of the, the psychology of the sun. So he sheds that psychology. And that's kind of what, uh, that shedding process is kind of what we all need to go through when we are, we, we are shedding actually the roles that we, that we acquire. In that tribal culture, like that happens when when they're very really young too, like yeah, 13, twelve, or twelve 13, or thirteen. Yeah, thirteen's the latest mm. because they they the Papua New Guineans understand, and this is very, very interesting, which actually goes against all sorts of Eastern and Western thinking around the world, developed nations thinking, is that they understand that if the son or daughter is dependent for too long, they develop. Uh, like a almost like a lifelong dependency on their parents and and which causes all sorts of different troubles down the line whereas as you know in the west and in, in the developed nations in the east there's the thinking that oh you know they're not fully developed until they're 18 and there may be some cognitive research to suggest that because you know we do develop still into our 20s and i mean there's each and every person is different biologically and psychologically but you know there's kind of a general template but those sorts of tribal cultures def defy that mentality because that's been going on for thousands of years you know what i mean it's not like that they just started doing this this has been happening for thousands of years and they've been producing independent people from a very young age i think that age uh, at the age that they do around uh, 12 and 13 is almost like they wouldn't have any scientific reference or whatsoever. No, but when you actually think about it, I think that might be the perfect timing to go through mm. the initiative um, mm. process because you th think about going through that sort of uh, physical battle to mm. survive, mm -hmm fighting against these uh, beings. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's all kind of set up. It's a set up. But yeah. for that uh, young boy to go through the experience mm. at age 12 or 13, you go through such maturity very quickly mm. going into the teenage um, years. Yeah. years. They, so you already solidified your independency uh, physically and mentally at a... Mm. The actually very the pinnacle uh, time, time yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, see, that's the difference, right? Because in the mm -hmm. tribal cultures, they're looking at teenage years as the years when you begin in your adult life, yeah. where we're looking at teenage years as a thing on itself, and we're looking at adults as a thing on itself. But they're looking at the teenage years as no, no, that's when you, that's when you become independent. You're still, you're not in your infancy no more. You're not like a kid, so to speak. You're growing pubes and you're going through puberty. This is, you know, you're becoming a man and a woman. We were talking about this before that how our modern education is unnecessarily, probably unnecessarily too long. Mm, yeah, of course. Because yeah. we all spend 12 years of our early life dedicated to um, education, mm. predominantly intellectual education, mm. right? Mm. Acro across the globe. Yeah. And in a sense, in intellectual education is, yes, okay, ne necessary. But psychologically, by age 12, 13, we can sense and we can learn of other people and we can make a basic judgment on what's right thing to be doing and not what's not right, right thing to be doing. It's pretty already established yeah. psychologically. So social dynamics already been 
registered in our mind, right? Mm. Intellectually, probably not, still not mature enough, but in the society to navigate through life day in, day out, you're probably ready to be independent, right? Yeah, yeah of course, yeah. So that if you were to look at that way, if we can educate our children much more with a mature way, mature manner at that age. You know, like how we treat 15, 16-year-old young people like mm. children. Like children, Like yeah. mm. young kids, really, you know. Mm. It doesn't have to be that no, way. No, no, it doesn't have to be that way. But they may, in the developed countries, they may appear to be children because we've, we're still nurturing them through that process, do you see? Well, yeah. This is why you and I have talked many times. Like sometimes when we, well, when, when we do spend a lot of time in India, we'll see like an eight-year-old in India who's been working as a chaiwala for since, or, they were five. since they were five. And his level of maturity far exceeds a 21-year-old in Australia or Korea or in America. And we used to get blown out. Because we're having a conversation with this eight-year-old like he's an adult. And an eight-year-old, we, we would be in conversation in English with him. Yeah, yeah. And next to me, talking to Japanese in yeah. Japanese person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what the hell? Like he's, still, like, he's still a kid. He still has, like, you know, he still likes to play and stuff like that. But his level of intelligence is already developed. It's a level of intelligence you can't get from an IQ score. It's a level of intelligence you get from giving that kid a certain level of independence and the confidence to do to live a life mm. that, that, that they're living, you know. And that's what they, that process in, in Papua New Guinea does and in other tribes like that, you know. And it's it's funny because like, even like if, if I look at my mum, my mum started working when she was 13. She had a full-time job working at a lolly factory when she was, when she was 13, mm. you know what I mean? Like when I was growing up and mum was telling me that and dad was telling me all that, I'm like, because it's nuts, right? Like mm. at 13, I'm only just starting to go to high school which would be middle school and career or junior high in America. We, we, only, have, we only have primary you know, mm-hmm. high school here. Australia's too simple. But um, I'm only just going to that level of education. Mum never got to that level of education. Her circumstance was uh, a circumstance of the, her family situation. She has 13 brothers and sisters. Crazy. And she... Um, at, ironically, at 13, started working at, a, at a, a lolly factory. And actually, when I think about it, both of my brothers were, they left home, uh, not left home, they started working at 14 and 15. You know, yeah. Scott, my, my oldest brother, he, he left, actually left home when he was 15. You know, mm-hmm. only my sister and I had further education. Mm-hmm. And so, not that that, developed any sort of level of maturity with my brothers <laughs> but <clears throat> it uh in some countries there is still that level of uh giving the the uh, at least a 15 year old the responsibility to go and uh you know explore life on their own and but it's but it is different to what we were speaking about to, mm. with the indigenous cultures mm. and, and and children in india because you're kind of not mummy and daddy are not still hanging around the corner you're just you're just out there you know, and you and you've shed that role that oh, I'm a dependent son or daughter on my parents. You've you've begun to shed that. It may not firmly take grasp even after the ritual, but <clears throat> it's supposed to symbolise that. You know, and and I think that it, it does with a well from everything that I've heard, a lot of those younger uh, teenage boys actually do start doing their own things and and living their own independent lives, which frees mum and dad to do whatever they want, you know. <laughs> yeah, that ritual symbolises a lot more to do spiritual mm. advancement. Mm, mm, mm. That um, yeah. uh, Spiritual advancement comes with the psychological shedding process yes. and that's what it really symbolises. 100%, 100%. Mm. And that's, again, part of what we're talking about today with, with What Am I? It's, it's about shedding those labels that we have even gender labels and this and that like things that we're supposed that are supposed to define who we truly are and they don't define who we truly are okay yeah sure there's i mean there are genders right there are men and women we know that i mean no one's gonna argue 
Oh, well, some people do argue these days, but we don't want to get into that. But you know, from a sane perspective, there are right. And but if you're identifying wholly with that, then you then that can lead to all sorts of problems, right? That can lead to uh, a man being you know uh, disrespectful to women, or it can lead to a woman becoming a feminist. All of these things where you associate too much with an identification. And then that leads to all sorts of trouble because you think that's who you are. It's not who you are. It can never be who you are, truthfully, or what you are, I should say. It can be who you are as, as a person you think you are, but that person you think you are doesn't really exist from, from, a, from a realistic perspective and from a Eastern spiritual perspective. That, what, that who you are is a person, is, is an accumulative set of knowledge and labels that you believe you are. So I'm Jason, I'm Australian, I'm apparently Caucasian, I'm male, uh, I'm, I don't even know what I would say, uh, Taoist or something like this, you know, and all of these labels that are supposed to define you, and, and we've spoken about this on the podcast many times, that I was always uncomfortable with all of these labels when I was young, and, and likewise with yourself, and probably most people listening and watching, and then it wasn't until I came across Eastern spirituality, thankfully when I was a lot younger, that I got the answers earlier on and I wasn't in my 50s, you know. Mm. And, and it just felt right. Like when I'm reading Vedanta or I'm reading Ramana or I'm reading Lao Tzu or I'm reading Buddha and they say, no, no, you know, don't worry, don't worry. It's not a secret. I know it. It's everyone else is fooled by this illusion, but you, you have woken up to this, this trick. With a lot of people who are starting this journey of a spiritual path, we all begin with the question, who, who are we, right? right? Who yeah. am I? The question. And I think that's a good start, mm. of course. But from who am I to what am I is uh, there is a bit of a process and a time and a gap there, mm. meaning... Starting the question of who who are we, who am I, is very feels right, natural, organic, mm. and that is because we never have thought of ourselves being uh, not being a individual. Mm. We never have thought ourselves never not being a person, a person, mm. right? Mm. And that frame of uh, thinking. It's very strong, mm. and that's been indoctrinated within us for entire our life until we ask that question, right? Mm. And even after we ask that question, we still think in terms of person mm. or the individual, and we still come from that perspective. So transitioning from the question, who am I, to what am I, is, I think, somewhat comes with the spiritual uh, advancement. Yes. Because that means you had uh, you had transition way of your thinking from person no, individual from individual to being non individualistic thinking, not personal thinking. You comes in uh, comes to in terms with the holistic thinking, the wholeness of thinking so that your perspective has changed from individual and personal to holistic mm. right and that process differs takes long time for some people and it takes doesn't take at all to some people right and once we gone through that time of keep questioning ourselves studying about ourselves reading these great texts and scriptures then the question transcended to what am I, then we're on to some real business here, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's a great point, love, because it's the maturity to go from the personal to the impersonal, from the individual to the holistic. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of, especially when we talk about Western psychology, which has influenced a lot of, Eastern Asian thought as well, not so much South Asia, but Eastern Asia, is the 
that subtle Christian psychology that's within Western thinking, where you have the personal God, the one who, you know, if if you commit sin, you know, you you're in a, you're in trouble, you know, like so. There's there's a personal God who's always judging you and so forth and so on, as opposed to the impersonal Tao or Brahman, which loves and nourishes all but does not lord it over them, and you are an aspect of that. You're not separate from that. You are it. You are it. Mm. What am I? I am it. Like, as Papaji said, <laughs> you know, who are you, Papaji? He said, I am that. Mm. And that's, a, that's him, not in a sense of arrogance, but that's him reaffirming, especially as a teacher, that he doesn't want to make a delusion, even in himself, but also in, the, in his disciples, that he is Papaji or he is this person and at that time he made that validation was when he was coming to towards the end of his life so him holding on to this idea also of being published is kind of it's nonsensical because you know the, the gates are closing you know what i mean that he's 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 it's in the meaningless he's in the twilight of his life you know what i mean so that's the the the, the moving away from the personal understanding of the world to the impersonal understanding of the world and as you said that's a that's a great leap actually to go from who am who am i to what am i is a is a sense of spiritual maturity but also a sense of depth that you've re- that you have reached within yourself and that you understand and most people who probably listen and watch this podcast are probably at that stage where they're at that spiritual depth of wanting to or, or, or the understanding that they know that they're not the individual in, uh, innately. You know, they, they are this individual. It, and this individual, in a sense, is a role. Guy Young's a role. Jason's a role. And the only thing that you can do in this life is play the role well, but realize fundamentally that you're actually not the role. Because that role has to be given up. The movie will end. There's no doubt about it. That movie will end. But... Uh, you're not a, you're not attached to impermanence. You know that it's just uh, it's your life is like this a very brief season in the universe, and it will end. But it's uh, can you witness the crystal blue sky and all of the turbulence, the storm, the tornadoes, and all of that of your life? That's the what you are. Is that undifferentiated mm-hmm. Brahman or Tao? That impersonal reality, and so. We often ask, to, to your point before, we often ask, who am I? Because we're still associated and attached to the person we are. That's why we want to know who we are. But as you said beautifully, you almost have to be, or somehow, maybe not, like some rare beings, like Ramana Maharshi and, 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 and the Buddha, not even the Buddha, but say Ramana Maharshi, some rare beings like that, just go from zero to 100. But most of us start with the question of who am I? Because we, we feel uncomfortable with, this sense of self that we think we are and we know that it doesn't it's not right you know um, and so we explore our nature and sometimes we start well on the psychological level we look into that but then once you have access to more knowledge and more wisdom and then you start to go even to the next deeper level and you're like oh my god like didn't even think about that you know what I mean and then and then you go all the way we might we might um, misunderstand the question what am I is what mm, implying that kind of a matter like object <laughs> object because yeah. what what means like it's object what is this <laughs> what is this this sort of a uh, way of thinking yeah, so like yeah. we it, what am I itself for someone who uh, have no knowledge on spirituality for example mm. would be kind of stupid question right what mm. am i i'm not an object like this sort of um response but um is in spiritual path what am i as in like most fundamental question shifting the perspective from being an individual to being non-individual at like what am i meaning much more Subtle and subtly consciousness way, like what what is this all consist of really? Mm. Like mm. 
most subtle and uh, fundamental question mm. in the way it, beyond psychology. It's beyond beyond yeah, all, all thought, all beyond mental, beyond everything. It's actually incomprehensible, in in a sense. You can comprehend it, but the way that you become that is you have to do the you have to shed mm. the who you are. Because mm -hmm. the what you are is the undifferentiated consciousness. It's the Atman. That's what you are fundamentally. And the reason they say, like you said, you know, you could think of it in a sense of as an object, but the reason why it's just said what, because the undifferentiated consciousness or Brahman or Tao is not a person. It's not a, it's not a thing. It's no thing. It's nothing. It's not an object of knowledge. This is a thing, you see. Mm -hmm. Everything that we identify with who is an object of knowledge. Brahman Dao is not an object of knowledge. That's why they say in the Upanishads, you know, if you know the Brahman, you don't know the Brahman. It's when you don't know the Brahman that you know yeah. the Brahman. Because you haven't objectified it. You haven't mm -hmm. turned it into an object of knowledge. Because, for example, when you're talking about the undifferentiated consciousness at the core of our being, you can only come into alignment with that and, and be it and feel it. But the, the, the intellectual understanding of that is... It's quite tricky. It's quite tricky. That's why Lao Tzu said, I could explain this, I, I could try to explain this to you, but I would never be able to. So I just call it Tao. You know what I mean? He just calls it Tao the way. He can't... It's There's no intellectual framework. There are intellectual frameworks for it, right? But it's kind of pointing you to that, but it's not that, right? That's essentially why they say, a lot of spiritual teachers, you have to, in a sense, drop all the knowledge in the end because it's only a, a map. It's not the territory. And when you've identified the map as a territory, that's when all problems occur. That's when you become a you know another division separation division separation and you become a know it all and everything mm. like that too. So, but you, the the role is not to identify the the map and the territory. the The map only shows you the terrain, shows you the directions of where to go, but it's not the actual experience. Mm. You know, we could tell everyone how wonderful India is, and like you know, we went all all around and blah, 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 for many years, and they could sit there and go, "That that sounds wonderful." But it only sounds wonderful. It's not the actual experience. We're just telling you about it. You haven't actually went there. The experience itself is much better than just hearing it from, from someone else. Definitely. It's much more to do with the, your state of consciousness. Mm. That's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you would be very aware of this knowledge, mm -hmm. what that is, but doesn't mean anything if you don't embrace it and internalize it mm. meaning that you become it you are in that state of mind where Tao is really yep. mm. in from that state of mind they they you fully became one with the almost the question what am i you have the answer mm. You have the answer mm. just from being in that state of mind. Exactly. Mm. Well, that's the essence of the that the great Mahavakya Tatvamasi, right? So I am that, or I am Brahman, but it's uh, I am Brahman without the I. So, like you said, you've become that. You've you've dispelled all illusions within your mind. They're all gone, and your mind is completely reflective. And trans transparent, and nothing sticks to you. You've you've had the f complete absorption in Brahman, which what we would call samadhi or nirvana or satori. These experiences, and then you are not then operating from beneath the level of the source, which would be the ego. And you are operating from the level of the source. So you've become, as Alan Watts would say, you've become an aperture for the universe to express itself. Mm. So the Tao is just moving through you effortlessly. You appear still as Gayang and you're still, you know, 
doing these funny things. But it, it the, the level of understanding is, is different, you know. You know fundamentally from your, your localized awareness that something else is running the show because that sense of you running the show has actually dissipated, has down-regulated, and it's not there anymore. It doesn't mean that you still can't converse and operate as a human. That's, we're not talking about any sort of new agey nonsense like that. But the understanding is there within you, you know. Mm. Like what Zhuangzi would say, you're still operating as a person and you still have a role, but that is just something that you're playing. It's just something you're doing. But the the identification or the or your awareness has sunk into the actual pure awareness. So your local awareness has become merged with the universal awareness. But that can only come through what we're talking about from that transition from the who am I to the what am I. And that can happen through years of meditation and years of practice at something. Or it can happen instantaneously for some rare beings who have, have an aptitude for understanding it. Even that uh, transition from who am I to what am I is only can happen when you stop identifying yourself as an individual mm. 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 and that you you no longer this name, this mm. role, mm. Mm. this memory, mm. this conditioning, yep. everything. You shed all this... Um, psychological history yeah. basically yeah. you select all and delete <laughs> <laughs> almost yeah, 100% then that you elevate your perspective elevate your state of consciousness yes that you fully operate your operate system is fully um, transcended mm. and coming from that place purely yep and of course, at times, these uh, memory and things like that, it triggers you sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's not like anything bad or it's just a very natural and biolog biological, I think, because mm -hmm. that's how our body and body brain is designed that way. Because, for example, we, went, we would go to somewhere that's... Um, unfamiliar mm. and you get to see similar um, image what's right in front of you mm. or you smell something very um, distinctive mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you are in this uh, past memory and you are reminiscing about something what happened it, that, that's very natural and mm. biological yeah. I think that's mm. not something that you need to condemn yourself about it it's just completely natural. But that's sort of that's not what we're talking about. No, it, but yeah. what I'm saying is that you no longer get triggered by it from that place. From that place, yeah. You don't. You are able to make a clear distinction that that's just a memory, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you don't react from it anymore. Mm -hmm. Whereas in daily life, if we're not aware really on what's going on within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Whatever triggers our mind, we just react straight away, right? Mm -hmm. That's because there is no that gap mm -hmm. between what's true and what's not, exactly, right? Yeah. But from that place, uh, we have a clear distinction. All is seen from that place, right? Yeah, so that we always act appropriately and we also act appropriately, meaning that we almost we think appropriately yeah of course yeah well it does yeah you still say for example if you like the smell or the taste of pizza mm. that will remain mm. but that's seen as well and that's just something that as you were saying is something that identified with your particular taste as a, as a biological organism and that's nothing that actually causes you suffering you know the who am I is, is more associated to images and beliefs and those things about yourself uh, cause, cause you suffering. For example, if you liked pizza and I said, oh, pizza's the worst food in the world, you wouldn't even think anything of it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But if you had an associated belief and I said, 
oh, that's all rubbish and mm. so forth and so on. Then it hits you deep, see? You hear all the time, right? People will have a crack at someone, ah, oh, that food's crap. Mm. But they don't care two, two things. Well, I like an answer, right? You should try it, you know? It's just, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like this. So it's not like a, a, a belief about oneself mm. that's on a psychological level because mm. it's more adapted just to the biology or the, mm. or the gunas mm. of that a particular person. Mm. Or that constitution of the particular person, mm. so it's not really mm. something that's at a at a at a very deep level. You and I like masala chai. We're always drinking masala chai on mm. the podcast. Mm. That's just we enjoy. Mm. You know, it's the, there's actually nothing to think about that. You just mm. you you enjoy, and that's it. Mm. You know, obviously, if you're enjo- if you're enjoying excessively, look, that's a whole other mm. a whole other conversation. Mm. But as in um. When something triggers your negative past memory, for example, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you still, um, who at at who am I level? You would still um, maybe have a bit of pain, yes, suffering. Of yes. It'll just uh, slowly, slowly come and at you and get you eventually. Yeah, yeah, Hopefully yeah. not, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. But the what am at when you are transcended to what am I kind of state of mind mm. that negative emotion you can still look at it as a very objective way yeah. like you you with a bit of a distance mm. right mm. and that's a good place well that's why they say that those when you're at that place you are always conscious of the crystal blue sky but you see the clouds but the clouds you're not focusing on the clouds anymore your awareness is not absorbed with the movement of the clouds Likewise, you're not absorbed with the contents of your mind. That's the difference, right? So a mind of no deliberation doesn't mean thoughts and those associated memories don't pop up because it, it's probably almost impossible to get rid of all samskaras, all subliminal imprints, but you're not, your awareness has sunk into that impersonal Brahman. So you're just looking at it like you're looking at, you're always aware of the crystal blue sky, but you, the clouds are there, but they're just moving. But you can still see that your your awareness has not diverted from the from the clouds. You're not going with it. You're not going with mm-hmm. it. Your head's not moving. We're constantly in the habit, as humans, of wandering with the mind, going with that thought, going with this with this with this thought. Yes. Oh, it's, this is a scientifically scientifically proven that we are so attracted to objects. Yeah. So since we're in your new new world. New world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as we get yeah. older, we get more mm. complex, mm. where we become attracted to the objects of the mind. Mm. That's why a guy can, or, a, or a lady can sit around for hours and fantasize about whatever, whatever mm. you know what I mean? And then half a day is gone, mm. and they've been fantasizing, they've been living just in their mind. It's not an, it's not an actuality. It's images in their mind, impressions that they're, that, that they're looking at. The enlightened mind doesn't divert its attention. It's like that analogy of the, the car, right, where the, it's pouring rain and you're driving and the windscreen wipers are on. Our mind generally is following the windscreen wipers. Mm-hmm. And what happens when you follow the windscreen wipers? You're going to get in a big crash. Mm. There's only the road. Mm-hmm. And the mentality is mm-hmm. that there's only the road. And so all you're driving, the windscreen wipers are doing this. This is the contents of the mind, mm-hmm. but all you see is the road the way, the Tao, and you're just moving. Mm. There's not an attraction to this or that. Mm. And that, and that's the, the essence of what am I? Interesting thing in the human psychology is that, like, we as a human species have something distinctively different from the other species, mm. which is will. Yeah, yeah. We have this will mm. to do something, mm-hmm. right? And that's some. That's a place where we need to apply it appropriately. Yes. The will to see the what's directly in front of you, mm-hmm. not what's moving, right? No. Well, that's why in Buddhism they make a one of the big elements of Buddhism is bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the will to see, mm-hmm. though the focus to see the road, and not to, you know, yeah, move, for, around. move around and wander here and there. And also a lot of um, spiritual teachers also say that we, we have desire. We should have desire not to desire. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's the deeper level of that is that you don't, you, you have to get over the desire not to desire mm. 
but when you're on that path, you need a certain, you have to overcome desires. Right. Um, mm. And so it's very difficult to overcome desires with essentially no will or effort to do so. Right. You would have to be uh, born enlightened to do that. But that's not possible. So mm. you have to get out of that mm. uh, mentality. And uh, what I wanted to mention, because you, you were talking about before, with, like association with names and, and, mm-hmm. and everything like that, it's interesting that when we look at the spiritual traditions where you take on certain names to get out of that habit. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, you know, Ramana Maharshi is not born Ramana Maharshi, right? Mm-hmm. He's born Ken, Venkanta Ramanaya. But the, the taking on of a, a, a sacred name is the relinquishment of the, the persona. That's what, the, that's what that symbolizes. Yeah. I know that that has that tradition and culture has been completely destroyed from Westerners taking on names. Oh, now my name is Jason G. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's been completely destroyed. When usually you have to be given the name, you have to actually. In let's use Vedanta as an example, right? You have to have gone through a long process of spiritual training under a master for the master to ensure it if you're ready to be given that name. Has Guy Young actually transcended the ego? Has or does she have a distance between herself and, and that sense of ego? That's what we mean by mm. not that the ego disappears, mm. but there's a there's a dis- mm. distinct gap. There's a there's an awareness. There's the seer in the scene, right? And so has she done that? Okay, now Okay, now she can be called Gayangji, you know, or whatever. <laughs> she can be called uh, Gayangananda or someone like, <laughs> you know, you can call someone like this, right? But that has to happen, that in, traditionally had to happen through that process. Someone was given a divine name because they had reached a certain understanding. That was that almost like a form of um, initiation. It's a form of initiation, mm, yeah. You, you're new name was given given by your yeah. master yeah right. and it's and it's mm. because you have got to that level and and it's just a point of utility it's like a, you need a name to function yeah. in society and people need to call you something so but you're not the person anymore so it's stupid to call them by your birth name mm. and the one who's accumulated all of this mm. this this knowledge and so forth and so on and so, you know, I wanted to raise that point. And it's also, you know, talking to that, not just, not just Krishnamurti, but if you look at Judy Krishnamurti and you look at when he would have, uh, uh, well, let's say satsangs. Right? There really were satsangs. He would refer to himself as speaker. So, and Judy, because he was big on getting rid of the individual, he called himself as speaker because that's really what was happening from that level of the impersonal mm-hmm. is he's just speaker. There's no Judy Krishnamurti, mm-hmm. there's no audience, there's speaker, mm-hmm. and there's the ones listening. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's why he would refer to himself as speaker. Mm-hmm. Speaker says this, speaker thinks this. Interesting. It's interesting, yeah. Mm-hmm. But if you if you watch any of his satsangs, then you will notice that. Mm-hmm. Not Jiddu thinks this. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you, you, he goes, I as he goes, I goes. Oh, speaker thinks because <laughs> that's such an, a habit, right? We say I a lot, and that's innocent. There's nothing in that. But Jiddu mm-hmm. is making a point mm-hmm. in his discussions that he understands that there is no I, that there is only just speaker talking. Speaker is talking, and. People are listening. There's listener, there's speaker. You know, essentially. And in saying that, like when we look at even at the story of Lao Tzu, right? Lao Tzu in Chinese means old man. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, and it's, it's innocent, and we've probably all thought that once upon a time, when they, when they come across Taoism, they think that there is a guy called Lao Tzu, because a lot of the texts will have Lao Zhu, mm. and uh, in the Wade Giles romanization, you actually should be a hyphen Lao Tzu, because it's just 
it's just a, a title, like not old man. Mm. Old man's wisdom down the road there. It literally means an old man. Old man, yeah. Mm. If you say Lao Tzu in Chinese, they think you mean old man. But if you say Lao Tzu in the context of the Tao Te Ching in Chinese, then they understand you mean, mm. oh, that Lao Tzu, mm. the, old, the, the ancient old guy who had the wisdom. That's right. Real old. The real old guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic that that uh, dissociation with individualities all through Eastern spirituality, when we look at names and titles and so forth and so on, the Buddha, right? Mm. Buddha means just enlightenment. Mm. Oh, that's the guy who's enlightened down the road there. His birth name was Siddhartha Gautama, but he's, he's now Buddha. Siddhartha, Siddhartha Gautama is dead. Mm. You know, these are the two births of the, the Buddha, right? There's the Rupakaya birth, the, the physical birth of the being, and then there's the Dharmakaya birth, the birth of a Buddha. Mm. And the process of all of us is to go through that process and that's mm. essentially the process of the who am i to the what am i the what am i is you are the buddha you are naturally you're an enlightened being mm. liberation is your complete nature but you were born a person with uh, associated problems and and conditioning and so forth and so on and the journey is going from that to that the rupakaya birth to the dharmakaya birth mm. But we don't even, we don't go through, most people don't go through, or don't even know that, that that's an actual process that we're supposed to go through. No, not at all. Um, yeah, we live a pretty mundane life, right? Yeah. And a lot of people, actually a lot of people don't even get an opportunity to think in that way. No. And also the problem is that we tend to mythologize these figures mm. as in, yeah, in a story, yeah. right? Mm. Like not something that we ourselves can um, embrace mm. the, that kind of uh, knowledge. Mm. We just um, mythologize all these things mm. so that we make a separation between those great beings to ourselves, right? Exactly. And that we... Actually, they shouldn't be doing that. They were all human beings, just like ourselves. Mm -hmm. mm. There's levels to the mythology, right? Like, <clears throat> if you say uh, Hanuman really was a monkey and he flew over to Sri Lanka and this and that, okay, look, there's levels to mythology. Monkeys don't fly, and you know, so forth and so on. That story is 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 written for certain uh, for a certain understanding of what it means. But if you look at the Buddha, that likely was a historical figure who called Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha, right? And so you got to get out of that mythologizing that he was just this. This is just a story to understand that of your potential as well. It's not that. It's that any human, every human is a Buddha. It's but it's it, but it's it's a waking up to that fact. It's a waking up out of the hypnosis that you are an individual. When Buddha claimed that he was awake, when someone asked what, he, what was his teachings when he, when, he, when he had attained enlightenment, he just said, I'm awake. He didn't say, oh, I was enlightened or this and that. I'm awake. I'm awake to the hypnosis that Siddhartha Gautama was just this, this conditioning that was imposed on my mind that's actually not me. I am... I am the Buddha. You know, there's only nirvana. Everything is nirvana from that state of Buddhahood. You know. Yeah. If we choose to go to that shedding process, right? We can all be the enlightened one or awakened one. Yeah. And again, that shedding process is very difficult yeah. for a lot of us, mm. right? It's complete transformative way of think, way of looking at things, mm. way of perceive things. And it's kind of world upside down mm. type of thing. Because yeah. it's such a revolutionary process, I think. Mm. Because it's, it's difficult, difficult process. And then for a lot of us that uh, to go through that journey of in the spiritual path that we need to go through a lot of um like 
confession meaning as in being honest with yourself yes. and uh, thoroughly observing yourself uh, as in to see what's really going on within your mind, right? Yep. Even like littlest movement, movement of your mind. Yep. Like not to reminisce and sit and really like think about those. No. You just purely look at it and it'll be there and it won't be there in, in a few minutes. Yep. Like all these things that observing ourselves, they're kind of, process it's um it's pretty it's pretty hard in this day and age to do it Mm. 100 percent. yeah because we're trained to pay attention to the person yeah to the noise in your mind Mm. and society is because society is influenced by the noise in the mind they're trying to constantly have you attracted to the noise that's Mm. why drama is the highlight of the news that's why the television shows are often violent and 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 uh, very dramatic to capture your attention and, and and there's nothing wrong with that right that's good that can be good storytelling but the problem is it's training your awareness to be uh, attracted to noise attracted to the vrittis in the mind right so when we look at our localization of awareness we all have the same pure awareness right the problem is with this pure awareness we are trained to be attracted to vrittis, the whirlpools within the mind, the noise. So our, our, our pristine lake of mind, untouched, is like is bubbling and there's tidal waves and there's, there's all sorts of things going on in our mind. And our awareness is constantly focusing on that, the, the, the windscreen wiper analogy. And so in the world that we live in, because they want you attracted to the vrittis, it's hard for people to come to that... Mm the deeper awareness there's no doubt about that Mm. we've all suffered from that Mm. right but when you wake up you can't really turn a blind eye to that you have to continue to do that work and that's why actually meditative practices and that were cultivated right so if we look at a lot of the great meditation practices if we look at vipassana uh, zazen if we look at tai chi chuan uh, qigong you know hatha yoga all of all of these uh, even even self inquiry, even actually, and people may disagree with this, but even philosophical inquiry, what you are doing in this process is you are training the awareness to to look at the road. You're training your awareness to constantly see the crystal blue sky instead of the vrittis. And what happens in the process of after years of meditation? Sometimes it takes um, shorter amount of time for some rare beings with a high aptitude for spiritual knowledge. But for most of us, it takes years. And what happens is, is the, the vrittis begin to simmer and they begin to subside. The waves begin to subside and the ocean becomes more tranquil. And what happens there is then you can actually see then your nature. Your, awa- your awareness is, clear, is clean. It is not disturbed by the noise here and the noise here. The vrittis subside and you can see the road. The windscreen wipers are actually turned off then and you can see the road. And that's the stage that we all need to get to, is is to that stage. But we need to go through a lot of that process. We need, you know, I I mentioned philosophical inquiry. Sometimes it's because we are intelligent beings, humans. And so we do have an intellectual capacity and that intellectual capacity needs to be stimulated to understand what we're talking about. People wouldn't listen to our podcast here if they weren't stimulated intellectually by what we're talking about. You know, So you have to be stimulated intellectually, but you also have to put theory and practice together. It's Theory and practice are, are the two sides of one coin. And so you put those together and then instead of society training you to... Be attract, training you to be attracted to vrittis. The spiritual traditions are training you to see mm. what you are, and that's the fund. That's why Eastern spirituality, especially, has always been uh, counterintuitive and 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 also diametrically opposed mm. to socialization. Mm. 
And that's why within all of the traditions, most of the great sages have broken away from society or even condemned society for being hypnotic. Because mm. we live in a hypnotic world, right? And when you live in a hypnotic world, you live in an unhealthy and insane world. And people are walking around unhealthy and insane and they don't know about it. That's why Zhuangzi actually, when he speaks about Taoism, he speaks about it as in a sense of immunity to the social ills. Mm. He speaks about Taoism as this, as this uh, spiritual system that gives you immunity to the social ills of the world. You know? And that's why even when we look at the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism, when you look at uh, uh, the first one, when you look at we, as we suffer, what we could talk is sort of like what Thich Nhat Hanh talks about, is you're talking about uh, ill being. So the being is ill. It's because suffering is, is a choice, right? Suffering is a choice that we, again, because our awareness is attracted to the vrittis, we choose to suffer. Physical pain is not a choice, right? If I cut your finger off and I cut my finger off, we feel both the same pain at maybe differing degrees. It depends, but the pain will be there. there. Mm. But suffering is a choice. You, you are choosing to dwell in that pain and that's psychological suffering or you're choosing not to. And the associated habit because of our uh, socialization, our social training of awareness is we're constantly looking at suffering. We're constantly looking at, oh, I'm anxious, I'm stressed, I'm depressed, I'm this and that. And socialization wants you actually to be comfortable with that, to dwell in that because that's what keeps society alive. Um, something that we mentioned before podcast actually that um, this chronic stress and accumulative stress over time in the end affects our biological being it changes structure of our bi biology mm. meaning it'll be a lot to do with the body being out of balance mm. and this is linked to this uh, subtle biology subtle body mm. so that uh, the damaged part of our brain and nervous system and glands and whatnot from the social stress and things like that is a yeah irreversible mm. so that we there is a high poss possibility that we can be subtly psychopathic, mm. right? Mm. And it's that much our social dynamics are complex, somewhat very destructive to our nature. Mm. So that it kind of end up, it's given us no option really. Mm. Either you want to go the other way or you choose to be Somewhat, no. yeah, in, insane person. Insane person, yeah. Yeah. And people are in, walking around insane without even knowing it. But again, that's the height of insanity. That's how dangerous it had become, actually. Mm, 100%. It, right now, it's happening. Yeah, it is. And it, it, it disrupts with our biological being mm. so that we don't even know, we can't even be conscious of it our own actions and thoughts no because the society is training your whole psychosomatic organism to be a certain way mm. and usually when you're living in stress and anxiety you're closing your system up mm. and you're you're actually your body is not put together properly which sounds interesting but like when you even like for example if you go and see a masseuse right as soon as they start to feel your body, they go, man, your body's not put together. Mm. It sounds a bit strange when you hear them say that, but like when they say that your body's not put together, they mean you, you have been living in a certain state which has, put your, which has actually pulled your body apart because that's all coming from your psychology mm. and, and your attraction to the vrittis and the suffering, which is depleting your endocrine system, depleting your adrenal glands, and is, it's impeding... Uh, your meridians, your nadis within the body. 
and any it, changes the physical changes your yeah body your biology biology and yeah. leads to sickness mm. you know mm. and leads to to death you know I, I only look at oh, my yeah. I only look at my parents like when mum died and dad couldn't live without her Mm-mm. the stress killed him you know not mm. the so called cancer that the cancer was a byproduct of his stress mm. and you know research in that does obviously tell now that stress is a is a you know a big contributor to is it's like a carcinogen to 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 cancer mm. And yeah. so if you're constantly dwelling in stress and anxiety, depression, then we shouldn't be surprised when people commit suicide. We shouldn't be surprised when people fall ill. Mm. It's, not, it's a no-brainer. But because we live in this scientific world, which is built on just matter, uh, it's hard for science to accept that. It's hard for people mm. in general to accept that. Oh, he must be eating some terrible food or something like this. And it's like, no. He's been living in stress for that long. He's been anxious for that long. His whole body is clamped up and chi can't flow freely. Like the system is not open. Mm. You know, your system is not open. And so that can lead to, you know, but, but sorry, love, but, but also uh, I, I, don't, I don't want people to think that, uh, say, for example, like uh, Buddhist meditation, the, the, the that level of un, that spiritual development of Buddhist meditation when you're when you're in that higher level actually has an effect on your mind, on your body too because you're not you're not just accessing this you, you are accessing the parasympathetic nervous system which then releases the tension in your body mm. they don't uh, for example people who practice say zazen and this and that they don't need to practice in some sense qigong or tai chi juan or something like this even though there are uh, systems like the Shaolin uh, Temple and that that ha- incorporate Buddhist meditation and Taoist meditations and all that together. But we don't want to come across as like this is way is better than the other. Mm-hmm. They all have an effect on the tension within our body. And so society winds us and, and really tightens it up like a rubber band. Mm-hmm. Meditative practices loosens that. Mm-hmm. And then you feel that in your body, you feel that in your mind. Mm. Again, if your psychology is loose, if your mind is loose, your body is going to be fine. You know? mm. The problem is we all, a lot of people are all living with hypertension. Subtly, on a subtle level, are living with hypertension because mm. society is a tense world. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the suicide rate is going higher and higher, things like that are the result of the that disease, yeah. disease that we get from stress. Yeah. I would call it it's a disease. disease. It's a disease. It's, it's, it is. It's yeah. a mental disease. Yeah. That you one look like you're sick, mm. but you actually a lot of us have disease. Disease, yeah. Right. Well, mm. Dalson would take a step further. Zhuangzi would take it a step further and say that it's a disease, but you're insane. Mm. You are insane and you're unhealthy. Mm. Even though your skin can look good, you can move. Ar- right. You think you're all healthy and you're all mm-hmm. good because you can move around and you can work and you can cognitively function. Mm-hmm. But you're a, you are a suboptimal creature. Mm-hmm. Even like how many cases we hear about it, like really like fit and muscly and this type of people mm-hmm. really like um, mm-hmm. physically very you know yeah. fit fit yeah. and all that. Those people often. You know, get heart attacks. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. Because physical stress is a thing too. Yeah. And that's why, you know, those certain Eastern spiritual paths would say that you can't overcompensate for one or the other. Like, Mm. you have to find, it's all about balance, right? So if you're just consuming a lot of food and you're just pumping iron and this and that, though you may win Mr. Olympia, um, you've put a certain element of stress on your body that you can't in some sense you can rewind that a bit you know what i mean but the but the the stress has happened no matter whether you want to believe it or not you've put so much stress on your body um which is uh which is which has taxed your to use um 
Chinese uh, Taoism, uh, the three treasures here, you've, you've tapped a lot of your jing, your, your genetic code, mm. and you've spent a lot of that battery, mm. which is going to affect your whole organism. And like you said, a lot of it, it's not, you know, a lot of athletes sometimes do mm. die of heart attacks and at mm. a very young age. There's mm. been ultra marathon runners and stuff like that. Mm. And again, that comes down to an imbalance where, because our mind, in our mind, we can do, we think we can do whatever we want, right? We get out of that hypnosis as we get older because our body can, it can't keep up with our mind mm. like it was when we were 20 and in our teenage years. But uh, we constantly, look, in this world of achievement, you know, mm. we want to, oh, I want to be able to run 220 kilometers and this and that. It's like, is that even like what did was that even possible like evolutionary speaking like is that i know you can do it i'm not doubting that you can do it but is it going to have long-term implications mm. you know and then and in, in thinking about that what are the long-term implications of socialization in general you know and that's what we've been basically talking about yeah. today right the long-term implications of socialization in general affects your whole system so this long-term implication of believing in a sense of individuality in accordance with a society has mm. far deeper mm. spiritual implications, biological, psychological implications. Mm. It's kind of a natural progression that you become somewhat ignorant to the society mm. once you advance your spiritual yep. learning, right? Mm. Because society constantly educate you mm. uh, who you are yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. but more you study uh, eastern traditions and philosophy and psychologies and all that you know that you are not this person anymore mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and you naturally stay away from that world you don't want to take part no. anymore well, that goes into what we were talking about last week, right? Like the Vairagya aspect. Mm -hmm. you, you have no attraction to it. You have no interest whatsoever. <laughs> like they, like people, I mean, other people can talk about all these political issues and yeah. uh, they're very, seem very invested, mm. don't quite understand, but I mean, it doesn't really uh, attract you anymore. No. It's not, yeah. Because they're living in the who am I? Mm -hmm. They're living in the person. Mm -hmm. They're living in that person. I'm invested because I'm left wing or right wing or I'm this or that. So there's this self protection, this self preservation, and the self preservation only applies to the person. There's no self preservation when you understand that you are the Brahman without the I. Nothing to preserve. There's nothing to preserve. Nothing. You are it. Yeah. You are the essence of the whole cosmos. There's. Preservation that arises in it. It's a phenomenon it, in it. That's right. And it will go. And, it, and when the universe goes and it collapses in on itself and a new universe is born, there'll be new things. Preservation. It's, there'll be, that's, the universe will look differently. It's funny you mentioned that because I remember in a satsang with Muji back in 2009, there was a guy that spoke at the satsang and he's a really nice guy and he, he wasn't saying it in the sense of uh in a funny way he just it was it was just inquiring with muji because he said to muji I, i've just i i've uh, i don't i don't have any like interest in society anymore i've just i've lost do you remember this one and he's mm -hmm. like i lost we, we watched yeah I, I lost social uh, just social interests, like no interest in society. And Muji's like, oh, very great. Because <laughs> I don't know if the guy was expecting Muji to say, oh, you know, you need to probably, you know, get a, get a hobby he, or something. He, Muji had this good, nice That's smile. Like, oh, this is very good. Very good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Because from an Eastern spiritual perspective, that's right, right? Like if you, if you have no vested interest in society and interest doesn't, and society doesn't interest you, you're at a high level. You're at a real high level because you're not 
interested in influencing other people or the world or imposing your will and you have no agendas you have no beliefs to to impose on other people that's the big thing you no longer have any beliefs or agenda to defend or impose to other people right mm-hmm. yeah because that's the essence of what we're talking about that's mm-hmm. where the what am i is mm-hmm. there's nothing from that state mm-hmm. so when someone says to you when you're in that state how come you don't interested in this and that I just don't care I remember back when our friend stayed with us actually in Sydney back in 2010. And he was talking to me about Australian politics and he's like, you know, and I just said to him, look, I I don't even know what you're talking about. I just don't care. And he got got angry about it, like saying, what do you mean you don't care? And and this and that. And, and And I just said, look, it doesn't exist really. Like what you are investing your life into doesn't really exist. And it doesn't define who any of us are. It only defines who you are when you believe it defines who you are. You, you have a belief in your identity. So the, the higher spiritual aspect is when you have no belief in your identity. I mean, politics, I mean, it, you wouldn't even, it, it's just like a piece of turd on the ground. You wouldn't even, you wouldn't even look at it. You know what I mean? Like it's nothing to be excited about. And so if you're at that stage where you've, transcended those certain interests and you're at you are coming into that real kernel of truth where your mind is completely free of association with external images beliefs and mental images and beliefs within your mind you are you are going even deeper which is uh which is a great boon that's one of that's you're you're getting into that that deeper element in that place, you are free from conflict. Mm. You are free from um, everything. Really. Everything, yeah. yeah. You have no, you have no opinion on what's happening outside. Yes, you need to become the opinionless being. Mm. If you have no opinion, then you are at a high level of spiritual understanding. Mm. When people are always trying to evoke an opinion out of you, and they want you to have an opinion on matters, and you don't have one. This is great news. Mm. You know, we live in this world. It's like what Alain de Botton was talking about, right? When he was talking about the the American mentality subtly influencing the whole culture of the world Mm. where we should be opinionated, we should have beliefs and this Mm. and that. We should strive to be uh, the greatest person in the world Mm. and this and that. But in reality, none of that's really true. I mean, some people can be like rich and famous and this and that. And is that even where happiness resides? You know, and obviously it doesn't because a lot of rich and famous people are, suffer from depression, and, you know, commit suicide and so forth and so on. And so our world, unfortunately, is being geared that way, that this very individual-oriented world when we actually need to be getting distancing ourselves from that because that's what's causing a lot of the troubles in the world psychological uh, troubles and so forth and so on and opinions can only rise from that individuality oh i have an opinion on that matter but if you ask them why do you have an opinion so this is a reversal of understanding what do you have an opinion for they just freak out they'd be like what do you <laughs> they wouldn't know how to answer it. Mm. What do you mean, what do I have an opinion? Oh, I have an opinion because I believe in this. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. So why do you believe in that? And then when you take someone down that rabbit hole, they get to that zero perspective. But there has to be a willingness, like you said before, there has to be a willingness to explore that. But unfortunately, as Alain Dubaton said, that this individualism and this... Uh, go get them success driven american attitude that's kind of being taken on in the whole world is keeping us away from that and it's kind of ironic that it's not ironic actually that a lot of people in america are turning towards eastern spirituality because they know the gig is up <laughs> the gig is up mm. this whole thing of the american dream and and uh we can all be famous and rich this is not true this is, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you look at capitalism and you look at all of this, it doesn't even make sense and it doesn't lead to happiness. And so a lot of people in America are like, no, hold on, hold on, no. 
this is why things like Buddhism and Vedanta and that are taking root in America mm. because you know it it's not a reality that that idea of uh, we can all achieve a certain level of success and affluence and uh, we can be individually great and this and that is all nonsense. And actually, as we've talked about on the podcast before, aspiring to be famous and and all, and and trying to get respect and this and that is the height of self-esteem issues. You have a low self-esteem. So you're looking for validation from other people, from the community, from the group. Yeah, desire to be liked and desire respected. To, and yes. Mm, you want to be a valuable individual to others and in society. Yeah. Mm. And you, that, you don't need any of that. From from zero perspective, that's all, that's just insecurity. Yeah. We all voluntarily um, choose to be in this under great hypnosis, I think, mm. that... Um, very materialistic way of thinking, mm. American way of thinking. Mm. So achieve success, um, achieve your goal, have a big dream and mm. Mm. be wealthy and famous mm. and all mm. this type mm. of thing. And that uh, defines how successful you are, this kind of thing. And who you are, and Appar- who you apparently. Are. Yeah, apparently, yes. Yeah, that's completely opposite way of what we've been talking about, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, all of that is, I, I definitely think that's a deep, deep hypnosis that we are under. And um, we need to break out of it. 100%. Yeah. And I think that we, I think that not a lot of people, but there is a minority of people in the world who, mm. who have come to that conclusion mm-hmm. in western countries we need we need to be mindful that still in you know places like bangladesh india sri lanka nepal pakistan parts of africa and even south america aren't hypnotized with that mm. kind of western mm. american style of thinking they, they still have a sense of communal values and based on their own traditions and so forth and so on but developed countries because they have access to a lot of especially american media mm. are influenced subtly by that and i think there is a media implant great fear mm. in us mm. they used fear as a biggest tool so that they can or we can get sold out to this product of mm. this hypnosis right mm. yep and if yeah so that we become fearful of not being like that or not thinking like that mm. right mm. and you take part you take part in it and when you see some other person who don't think the same then they judge those people in a certain way right and yeah it's almost like cuz you are acting out of fear mm-hmm. So it's somewhat like a bit spineless. Spineless, yeah. You don't have your own like dignity almost because you follow the fear. Mm. And that's what these media and, um, I don't know, corporations, they advertise yep. fear in a very subtle way, right? They prey on your insecurities. Yes. They know that you fear. Yeah. They prey on that fear. They make sure that you lean in towards your fear. You know, they yeah. want you to, and it all comes from the individual. Mm. You're an individual opposed to the world and opposed to other people. So you ought to be a certain way to validate your existence. Yeah. So we will prey on that. Mm. Oh, you should have a Porsche. Mm. You should have those new sneakers. You know, all of these things which are ridiculous when you understand the nature of reality because they're just preying on your material needs and your uh, social image, which in a, in a sense is, is, a, is a materialism because mm. it's an image. Yeah. So that's, a, that's a, an aspect of materialism mm. and you've fallen for it. Mm. 
And we innocently fall for it because we don't have access to knowledge. Society doesn't want you to have access to what you and I talk to talk about on this podcast. If they did, YouTube may recommend our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. But it's only the few who listen and watch who are really interested into the deeper elements of life and want to go to the core of existence. That's what this podcast is about. But... If you're talking about Madison Avenue, if you're talking about the advertising industry, they could care less about that. They would only care about that if it was commercial. It had commercial value. And it doesn't have commercial value. Unless you're a clever author who can write wax lyrical about it but turn it into some sort of thing that's about the individual. But you can't write a book about Vedanta or Taoism or Buddhism or yoga or something like that. Purely. Purely. Mm. Because... I mean, if, you, if you're writing that book in its traditional value, it's about the dissolution of the individual. So that's not marketable mm. for Madison Avenue. Because no. if they say that, if the conclusion of the book is that the what am I means that you are one undifferentiated consciousness, we're all part of the same Brahman, the individual doesn't exist, the advertising industry collapses in on itself. <laughs> there's, no, there's no more advertising industry. There's no more, there's no more politics. Nations dissolve. That's an ideal world to me, but yeah, yeah, yeah. not for them. I not guess. for them, no. Mm. Because uh, materialism, capitalism, the economy, everything is built on fear, built mm. on separation. It's not a holistic model. And this is why you see alternative theories popping up, like Dharmakism mm. in India, these things that oppose individualism. Mm. So it's more of a holistic model of economy and, and social system. Not that that's going to be taken on in India because it's gone so far down the path of capitalism and democracy and so forth and so on, but they still have a connection to their Hindu values and tradition. Mm. So there is a possibility maybe it'd be taken on. Mm. And then you'll just have this country on its own practicing something like Dharmakism, which is completely different to capitalism, capitalism and democracy, and, democracy mm. and so forth and so on. So... And I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, I don't understand why everything is based on Western values. That's one of the things that's very strange about the world and actually what conflicts with the Eastern cognitive style mm -hmm. because Eastern cognitive style is holistic. It's not individualistic. And that's why there are a lot of problems in, in certain Asian countries that can't take on that Western cognitive style, you know. But they tend to um, embrace the political regime. They they do, yeah. Because uh, they yeah they give too much value to that materialistic uh, society. Yeah. Well, that's why this. For example, you showed me traditional Korean music, which is amazing, but has but it, for whatever reason is not valuable, and K-pop is. K-pop is an individualistic medium for musicians traditional korean music is improv it's it's a synergy of people playing music and the the work itself is what has power it's not an individual that has the power you know where k-pop it's the individual that has the power and and what's stupid about something like k-pop is not half of the people don't even write their own music it's the machine promoting an individual who looks the certain role way. looks mm. a certain way. Hence, you don't see a lot of heavy people who are K-pop stars. You don't see, you know, they all have makeup on. They're all slim. There's a stereotypical... There's a, st there's a stereotype. Mm. I mean, it's not just K-pop. Mm. It's pop music around the globe. Oh, around the world, yeah. Sure, there may be a few heavy uh, people, but it's few and far between, you know. That itself is promoted a certain way. They, exactly. They package it in um, um, palatable yeah. to a popular culture yeah, way. Exactly. Mm. And that's what they do in places like Korea because they say like, I mean, K-pop is, is essentially a Western version, a, a, a Korean version of Western music. And it's packaged that way. And it's seen because the Western... Uh, way of economy and, and s social structure and that is seen as progressive and so they see that music also as progressive so when they look at their traditional music they just go ah that's that's what old people listen to 
You know what I mean? That's what old people listen to, you know. And this is happening all around the world. It happens in India too, right? That's right. It happens in India too. Mm. Where you have Indian pop. Mm. It's, you know, India's still different to Korea because Indian pop's not, I wouldn't say as popular as like listening to traditional uh, uh, Indian Indian music music. like Mm. mantras and so forth and so Mm. on. But because that culture is so, you know, all encompassing. But, Mm. But it all comes back to that individual perspective, trying to keep the person in the who am I and not exploring the what am I. You know, the what am I, the boundaries of the individual dissolve and you realize you're part of something much greater than yourself, the holistic version of reality, not just the, the communal level or the planetary level where we're talking about the universal level. But all those levels exist from a holistic perspective. Oh, I'm part of this uh, tribe, I'm part of this world, yeah. I'm part of this, it spirals up, you know. Mm-hmm. But they want you to, this from the skin, in is your world. This out here is an opposition to your world. Mm. And the reason why you feel it in your skin is because you're in opposition and it's pressing against you. And that's where stress and anxiety come from, right? It's the world pressing against your mind. It's constantly pressing and that's where the stress is coming, the tension is coming. But if you loosen this part up, the prefrontal cortex, the world comes into you and just and out of you. Mm. You are like a, an empty vessel. And that's the nature of the what am I, isn't it? Mm. What we've been talking about today. It's mm. the, the jiva, the individual, doesn't exist mm. from a fundamental level. All karma, all stress, everything like that only exists when you think you're an individual or when you believe in it. You don't have to think it. You almost need to allow yourself to see it that way. Yeah. Mm. You have to allow yourself to see it that way. You have to, yeah. You have to actually just, yeah, allow allow yourself the right word. You just have to think that way. Mm. You know, if you read a text, like say if you read the Mandukya Upanishad, I mean, constantly Gautapada is talking about it. There's no birth, no death. The what am I is birthless and deathless. Mm. The non-origination theory. You have to allow yourself to really absorb that knowledge and, and understand it and think about it that way. You and I, because this is what we're doing, what we've been doing for a long time, you read the Manduki Upanishad, you read that and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right, you know it, you know what I mean? The birthless, the deathless. What is born and what dies is the individual. And the individual is wound up in the images you have in the mind and also the over-identification with your body. The what am I is the birthless, deathless, always present, Mm. the eternal. That's the what am I. Mm. And that's what all the traditions are telling you to come back to, that that non-origination theory. Not the origination theory. Mm. Not that you are born, you have a name, you have a country, you will die. And then that's it. You have one life and then it's over. Mm. But the what am I is that you're none of that. Even karma, right? Even karma is, when they say you transcend karma, it means that you've got, you've got over yourself. You've dissociated with this sense of person. Mm-hmm. Only the person can accumulate karma. Yeah. And so when you transcend karma, when you transcend samsara, that's what it means. You've transcended karma. You've transcended this cycle of the karma, the vasanas, the samskaras. And then that wheel of samsara framework is stopped turning. So that you don't cause anything. Nothing. Yeah, there is no... You are the causeless. No, that's right. That's something I think we read, mm. something to do with Ramana. Yeah. yeah. You become causeless. Yeah. Because from that place, think about it, love. Think from that place, even when you act, you're acting from a place that's not birth, it's, it's, it has no birth, it has no death. So it can't accumulate karma. You're just acting. 
you act or you don't act and there's no accumulation of what even happens from that there's no intention or reasoning or um, agenda or belief behind that action mm. at all at all yeah mm. well that's like what you were saying before you just act inappropriately mm. for whatever the situation is mm. there's no deliberation like you're not thinking if I do that mm. Mm. It's just like, oh, that cup's about to fall. I catch the cup. Not like, hmm, if I go to catch the cup, <laughs> what's the probability of it smashing? Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. So, but that's the mentality, mm. right? Because you, when you come into that place of the Atman, the birthless, the deathless, I mean, because it has no birth, has no death, there can't be karma. Because karma is an aspect of causality it's an aspect of samsara so when you're an atman you are beyond samsara you have you have transcended the wheel of samsara and so the movement of the universe you you are beyond that you can't even be moved by that so that's when you've transcended fully you transcended karma fully yeah it's almost like that buddhist the way the Buddha sits, that immovable... The Bhumispasha. Bhumispasha. Mm. You're in that place. You, you're immovable. You won't be touched by anything that comes from outside. No. Mm. Or inside. Or inside, whatever arises yeah, within whatever arises, you. Whatever mm. vritti arises. Yep. It's seen. And it's just seen. That's it. It's just seen the cloud. Oh, wow. That's strange. Like what the monk, uh, the, the guru said that Alan Watts said that that time. Shiva's coming on funny today, isn't he? Because <laughs> everything is Shiva from that guru's perspective. Mm. When someone was acting all crazy, he's like, "Well, Shiva's coming on pretty funny today, isn't it?" And like, it's not that. It's a separate thing doing. It's it's one thing doing its thing. But when you're an individual and you think you're an individual with beliefs and doing things and influencing life and this and that, then. That's where karma comes from because your action does have an effect on the world. Right. But when you're coming from the Atman, from the undifferentiated place, your action is just is not overly employed. It's employed only when it's necessary. And it's not employed from a sense of belief or identity. So if they said to you, why don't you come and protest with us? Protest. There is no them versus us is my fool but there's no division mm. yeah you see to even do it is to believe in a sense of yeah. division and that in itself is the cause of the problem but no one wants to look at it that deep mm. because we've got to transcend all sorts of social norms we've got to transcend all sorts of social identifications biological identifications too beliefs but so when you come into the what am I, when you come into the non-origination theory of Gaudapada, of Vedanta, of Buddhism and Taoism, when there is no birth and no death, and you yourself as I never existed, that's hard to overcome, right? Because mm. society is driving you to say, you are someone, you exist. No, I don't. This is a temporary phenomenon. I believe I exist because... I'm living this brief point of time and it seems like this is the world to me. But just logically, the universe has been around for billions of years and you're telling me that this point in time is the most important point in time? Yeah. No. Yeah, that's quite deluded. Deluded. Yeah. Selfish. Mm -hmm. You know, egotistical. Mm -hmm. So that's what the what am I is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's that non-origination theory. It's that you were never born, you will never die. You actually never were. Mm -hmm. The individual is an illusion. Yeah. Hard for all of us to overcome. Oh, definitely. But at mm. the same time, if we're all engaged in the spiritual process, then this is the conclusion that we That's will reach. That's the ultimate place that we all should um, get to. Yeah, we will get to. We will get to. The promise is, even if it's this life or the next or whenever, or the next cycle of the universe, mm. you'll get there. Mm. But you have to think about yourself, when you, even when we say you will get there, when we say you, we're just talking mm. about the jiva mm. or the, the accumulation of samskaras, vasanas and mm. karma. 
not even a person. Mm. It's the accumulation of an energy of a sensation that is born, reborn, mm. and so forth and so on. That has to be cleansed out, and then you can reside as that crystal blue sky and have the awareness of that sky at, at all times. And everything that arises and comes and goes is just temporary phenomena. Mm. And that's really what it is, isn't it? Mm. So that's what we are. We could talk about that so many times. I mean, we will talk about Gattopada's non-origination theory one, one day, one podcast. But I think that's about it, huh? Mm -hmm. Yep. What do you think? We covered a lot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. Thank you for watching and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>